Producer choice. In terms of the context, why did it work and in what ways? Well, the BBC was a command economy. Everything was directly funded. But what Producer Choice did was to essentially give all the money to the channel controllers, stop direct funding of overheads, of resources, of BBC production departments, uh, give the power to the channel controllers who, who were free uh, to so, so, so the money followed the commission. The money followed the commission. And then so. what happened at the producer level? Because it was called producer choice. If you were a BBC producer, you were free either to use internal resources or to go outside. You controlled your own budget because you'd been given your budget by the channel controller and you, you had to make that um, uh, money uh, go as far as it could. I have to say, it was an exceptionally difficult thing to do. It was introducing, so to speak, capitalism to Eastern Europe. But very quickly, BBC producers, as you would expect of uh, some of the most creative people in the land, started to use their budgets very imaginatively. Guess what? They used fewer resources when they had to pay for them. We shall never know how many people worked at the BBC at that period. We tried to find, we tried to find out, but it was impossible. The best estimates would be that over 30,000 people worked for the BBC at the beginning of the process. Uh, and, but, and by the end, uh, it was more like 20,000. I think the civil servants could tell the politicians that the BBC really was being effectively managed, that the money was well spent, but uh, frankly, also, the howls of pain that emerged from the BBC also persuaded the politicians that these were not just empty words on the BBC's part, but something had really happened. Uh, and what effect did it have on the political dialogue? We would never have got the increase in the licence fee that we got at the beginning of 2000, which was the best licence fee settlement in the BBC's uh, history, an RPI plus uh, settlement that really uh, saw the BBC develop very, very strongly over the following uh, 10 years. Uh, you moved on to what you might call phase two. So you'd separated broadcasting and production. What was the idea behind that? And if you'd stayed, where would it have got? I would have been very happy for the process to continue where, whereby more and more production came from the independent sector, save only for one, uh, one issue, that I also believed in centres of excellence. I would be nervous of a pure market where there were no centres of excellence, no um, natural history unit where um, uh, over decades, the best scientists, um, the best technicians, uh, the best program makers have come together and developed very highly original and innovative techniques for making natural history programs which are better than anybody else's in the world. I'm not close enough to it any longer to know whether you can let the market rip in an area like that or whether it would be prudent to maintain those, uh, those centres of excellence. They're the questions on my mind but they're no longer informed questions. What do you think the perception is of the BBC today? Um, well, I think the, the BBC, not for the first time in its history, uh, has been challenged by recent events. And the BBC always has to return to this issue. Are we spending, can we prove that we're spending the license fee efficiently and prudently in the license fee payers' interest? It's going to have to do it again.